There we go. Um, hello, sir. Hello, Mr. Steve Mayer. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Lexi. Thank you for having me on. Uh, always look forward to these our discussions. Yeah, thank you for, for being here and thank you for agreeing to join. Um, I've been watching a lot of field researchers and I believe now you've been in the field for over 40 years. Um, yeah. With <laughs> instruments, doing, you know. Well, well, when I started, there wasn't really any instruments. I had one of those big fat tape recorders that I used to put full cassette in. I had a compass, I had a pen and a pad and a, a camera. That's pretty much it when I started in 83, you know, but uh, boy, uh, times have changed now. We've got all sorts of things that we can put our hands on, certain types of equipment. One of the coolest pieces of equipment actually I've seen you use is um, time dilation detectors. Yeah, DT meter, time displacement meter. Yes, I mean, what it is, is it's a small device that, and a very long probe. And you can have those lengthened, of course, to, you know, up to maybe 400 feet if you wanted to. And it measures the time differences, if there shouldn't be any, but between the meter and the probe. So if we realize that there's certain phenomena is taking place in a given location, we can take the probe into that location, run the lead out of that location to the meter. So we see any differences between inside the expected location or outside. And just occasionally we get um, differentials. You know, we shouldn't have latencies and things like that, you know. And it, though it's only, you know, microseconds, but they shouldn't exist unless miniature black holes exist. They shouldn't, they shouldn't exist, uh, which is a fundamental part of the evidence that we found in association to where the footprint of phenomena takes place. And that, and that will remain for a few days afterwards, if that's correct? Yeah, well, sometimes it's about 48 hours. Sometimes it's 72. It just depends. Um, but it's short-lived. And the only way I can describe this is, is that if there's been some form of phenomena take place there, some form of manifestation of a phenomena, then whatever it's space it's taking, two things in space and time can't exist together, according to Einstein's rules. And... I mean, even if even in a hole, there's something, you know, there's gravity waves, there's light waves, there's all sorts of things. But the manifestation, if, if it is a dematerialization of the phenomena, in other words, it vacates the location, um, it leaves something like, uh, I can only assume is some type of void, a footprint, and it collapses over a period of time. But if you can get in there fast enough and conduct the tests, then you can get results. And the problem is, is that, is that a lot of this phenomenon is operating outside human perception. And we have to rely on certain specific types of equipment to alert us to things that we're unaware of or can't see. I feel like this conversation is going to go into qu quantum mechanics pretty quick. Yeah, always. It's, you know, it, 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 well, it, inevitably it's going to involve quantum mechanics. Yes, of course, a lot of that will do end up into that area, yes. I mean, and that's part of uh, what I actually discuss is the very first thing I discuss in all my work is um, sensory evolution of a human being and how mm -hmm. we're essentially a toroid of energy evolving on the toroid of energy that is the earth, you know, flying through the infinite ocean of space, you could say. Yes. And so for, yeah. some, for something to be perceived, it needs to be in that same frame of motion. Well, it's very small for us. I mean, anything else on the planet has got better chance. The human being, and this is what's most interesting, the human being has been specifically designed in association with the phenomena so that it can operate around us without detection. I mean, insects, animals, anything else really on the planet has a better understanding and perception of these things better than we do. We, the humans, are seemingly designed in a way been limited or blinded to the aspects of other phenomena around us, which is intriguing because why should we be the most limited things on the planet to experience these things when, you know, even insects, birds, dogs, cats, anything really, you know, will have better perceptions than we do. And so I'm wondering now, is that a function of, because so there are some people that are very aware of, of this. Now, is is that a function of the you could say the DNA of the actual person, or is that a function of human focus? Where we I, I think I think it's a folk uh, a function of genetic alteration. I really do. I mean, you know, we can all look at the um, Darwin theory, and this is where people will get theory. You know, he wasn't convinced himself. It's a theory. However, we must have 
not evolved in so many ways, but devolved since the days of the apes. The apes, the apes can see better. They can see more in the dark than we can. They can see a better range of light, see a better range of things within their vision than us. They hear better than us. Um, they can breathe and swallow at the same time. They did the hair stops growing at certain lengths automatically, like the nails do. Do you know we just got worse in in that method, you know, of what's around us and our perceptions um compared to the the apes. So we have to question why. Why have us human beings been so limited? It's as if it's been specifically blueprinted to create the human being and make him blind to the phenomena on purpose around him. Um, because, like I say, you know, even people's pet cats and dogs, you know, will will witness things and we're oblivious to them most of the time. That's fascinating. I was actually in a conversation last night um, with, with uh, Patrick Compton, Artist and Tony, and basically Patrick brought up a point that there's, you could say modern Western civilization societies are very self-centered, self-focused. Um, they care about me, 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 uh, where you have more of an Eastern philosophy where everything is one. And so when it comes to, you could say, natural selection or mate selection rather of the human species, if you're focusing on yourself as the center, you're gonna have a different sort of evolutionary path versus if you are focusing on like the greater connectivity of everyone and everything. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you say, as, we, as we've gotten further and further from the apes, maybe we've started focusing on ourselves a little bit more than- we have. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, mod modern humans, I mean, we uh, we couldn't be any further from the spiritual path that humans, you know, endeavoured to walk on many years ago, even our ancient ancestors, you know, but since those times, um, the impurities in the body don't help, and that's basically because of the things we eat, the things we drink, the things we breathe, these toxins, poisons, radiation more than we ever have now. Uh, I, from in the past, I mean, we didn't even exist probably in the past. Um, um, these purpose made, you know, uh, um, radiation that is created by electronics and internet and all sorts of things. We live in a world of poisons that's going to take its toll psychologically on the human being, but it's not just that, it's just that we've been, we like we, we have been designed to be ignorant of the phenomena around us. Um, when our even our ancient ancestors, and we do know because there's plenty of evidence to say, well, do you know what? There's no way they could have built these things in certain given locations if they couldn't feel the energies of the land, if they couldn't hear infrasonic sounds. You know, I mean, there's lots of evidence to point that they were, you know, a lot better than we were at recognizing the things around them. Uh, and unfortunately, we've did, been divided. Um, and separated from our, our understanding and got further and further and further away as times progressed. And I don't think it's purely by chance. I think there's certainly some design in there. Yeah, um, so I'm um, thinking that design is more of the phenomenon itself then, when you say that, or? I, th I think, yeah, I think that modern day humans is is been designed to be manipulated at its greatest level by the phenomena because of our limitations. And I don't think those, I mean, we shouldn't have those limitations according to evolutionary theory. You know, we should be probably equal or if not a little bit more than the apes, um, but we're not, you know, and this is a, this is a, a big question that keeps coming up time and time again. Why is modern day humans specifically genetically designed to be blind, you know, out of the realms of, of our perception of eyesight and hearing and other senses of this phenomena. Um, it's like it's purposely designed to manipulate modern day humanity. So I want, so that leads me to think about the domestication of animals in general. So currently I work on a wild boar farm and basically when the wild boar first come in, they have a different state of mind. They're basically in a survival, very animalistic flight or fight state of mind. And you could say that their instincts become fully developed when they exist in that state. But when they come to the farm and they've been domesticated, within a month or two months, um, they no longer fear humans. Um, they'll walk right up to the fence. They just want their food. And then they, you know, they walk off and they do their hog stuff. Um, yeah. So in essence, in my opinion, I feel like humans have been be become somewhat domesticated 
to where our survival, our natural instincts never fully develop to begin with because we're so domesticated in essence. Yeah, I mean, we used to be. We used to be a lot better. The ancestors, the ancient ancestors were. Um, so what's happened since then? What's happened over the last so many thousand years? Um, something significantly has happened. Um, and of course, we have developed in strong social communities, which have certain belief patterns and teachings, which are inaccurate or not truthful um, and ignorant of our past and rather than just sometimes stepping forward in our research and that's good to do because of the new sciences that are employed but we must always you know we can never be ignorant of what we can learn from the past and that's equally as viable so is that a function of technology so now this is where it's such a complicated um, topic because many of the great inventions or great ideas or concepts have come to many people through dreams and they now spend much of their life trying to bring this new idea, this new concept, this new technology to market, to, to fruition. Um, and so where do those thought forms first come from, these people that are learning in their dreams and having their inspiration? And so that's been somewhat guiding, you could say, the, in quotes, evolution or the changes of the human being for quite some time. Uh, yeah, some, some people would argue, oh, it's just heightened intuition or they have some ability, but it's too much of that. It's gone on for too long. I mean, if you just want to take the space program for an example, we wouldn't have a space program if it wasn't for communications with non-human intelligences if through ritualistic um, practices. And that's not just the Germans, it's the Chinese, it's the, the British, the, the Americans. They've all been in it, in it, you know, trying to obtain data about how to get us the stars, advance us to the stars. And um, they would get the information. Some people might have suggested that you've got it in dreams. Yes. So uh, downloaded the information comes directly to them. And they'll go back into the office the following day and start manufacturing something. And it starts to work and it starts to, you know, gets it, it's employable into the program. And they get it, get us into space before we probably should have stepped out there, to be honest with you. And secretly, that's still going on even today. We just don't hear about it. You don't see it. I've got details of it. I've got photographs of the launches. I see Enochian, Babylonian, ancient Latin wrote on the side symbolisms, uh, and not just symbolisms and language on the side, but images, images associated to non-human intelligences. These are being launched regularly, but you don't get to see them because you know it's all cornered off, and these these things go on. This is why you know that there's such a big effort from anybody who does go into space to pay homage. They must pay homage through symbolism, launch dates, times, uh, Masonic uh, rituals in space, Masonic ritual on the moon. That was part of the you know, Masonic flag went in before the American flag. You know, so it's all about paying homage to thank you for getting us to the stars. And it's not just that. It's great inventors, things that they've manufactured, which has changed the world. You know, um, um, there's lots of people worldwide that have had those downloaded experience. Stephen Hawking's. You know, where did he get all these equations from? He got them in dreams every single night. Sometimes he wasn't even, he was working on something else and he would get a dream about a previous project. David Adair, rocket genius at the age of 17, who builds a rocket that travels so fast you can't see it at 8,420 miles an hour. You know, I read an article the other day that the Americans were concerned about Russians having a 600 mile an hour rocket. And I, thought, I just giggled to myself. I said, well, you had an 8,420 mile an hour rocket, you know, in the 1970s. It's all documented. There's proof of that. Uh, where did he get his information from? You know, containment fusion engine in dreams every night, you see. So and it happens to a lot, a lot of people. Um, so we are, it seems that we're, there's an intelligent source that seemingly guides us. Um, and there's plenty of evidence through experiments that the communications with these non-human intelligences are where future events. They're documented and they happen exactly as they say. So they're either guided to those events or they know what's going to take place. One of the two. Uh, so we always have to sort of question, you know, predestination and free will and things like that. But um, but guidance, yes. And it's not something new. This has been going on even in ancient times. You know, um, sometimes they would turn up and certain incidents that they, you know, be involved in would change history. 
Alexander the Great, for an example. You know, you he was helped in regarding besieging certain cities by the phenomena. Other areas, you know, they so been going on for a long time. They're not just watchers, but they do intervene and they monitor the and um, they construct. Um, they do so many things. It's a very, very vast operation on a global scale. I mean, I don't know if the one that comes to mind is Christopher Columbus. Um, you know, he yeah. saw the lights while he was coming to America. So he, yeah, uh, he was guided. To, he was guided in a sense at night to because where he was actually coming in through into into the Americas um, wasn't the easiest location to come to shore. Um, so he followed the light <laughs> in a sense in his diary. So, and then the furthest back example that just came to mind, it might not be accurate. I'm just kind of throwing it out there as an if. Um, I think it was Moses, part of the seas. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the thing with yeah, I know. I mean, there's actually more. There's actually evidence to support, support that Moses' way did cross the sea. Isn't in in fact the location, um, and there is another location where it would have been actually easier. But what is interesting is that some of the original documentation suggests that Moses um, was witnessing four fiery objects in the sky and conversed with some forms of intelligence. It's also interesting that the Ark of the Covenant is involved in in, in this. Um, the, the manna that came down or was a gift to subsidize um, um, the people in the masses regarding starvation um, and many things like that. So it's, it, it, it's very problematic because when we start dealing with old things and you've got to, sometimes you've got a little bit of story making, but with each and everything, and it's just like modern day legends and myths, there's so usually some element of truth to them, you know, which is, you know, it varies from one to the other, but there's usually something there and um, we know that the phenomenon has been ever present. There's no, this is a new phenomenon, or it started in the Saucer era. No, it's been going on. For, it dates back, as far as I'm aware, to, before um, historical documentation. So forever, in a sense of speaking, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, what originally got me interested in it is that I was learning in my dreams from the age of five. Like I was just naturally learning in my dreams, would wake up with an intuition of what's about to happen, also what I needed to accomplish in order to make certain things happen. Um, so people kind of wake up with this knowing and they don't really know where it's coming from, right? Um, no, 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 it's a mystery. Um, but what they do believe is that it's a deliverance of information as opposed to just tapping a pool of consciousness, should we say, um, that because everybody you would think would, would obtain that and that's not. And so it tends to be people that can make a difference people that are influencers are reached out to by the phenomena. I think that's where a lot of, um, you could say that our preconceived notions or things that we do believe that we can achieve in life come from the subconscious, um, oh. which is more related to delta and theta waves of brain harmony. Yes. Um, and so when people get into that meditative state or that dream state, the way I've come to see it is there's essentially information matrices, almost like radio channels. And so alpha and beta is like our awake state and we're interacting with this um, physical world. But then in delta and theta, you're actually interacting with a different information matrix that's outside our your average person's um, field of view because some people are lucid in their dreams, very lucid. And so they're more aware. And so I would call that like, how many channels can you be aware of at one time? And <laughs> most people are aware of that alpha beta state, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that just hammers home in regard to the latest research in regarding the um, the observer effects, the conscious connection with the phenomena. At that time, we now know that we can measure our brainwaves during experiences. And what's interesting, what we discovered, because they're pretty new devices that we have now, and what we realized when those incidents take place is that the phenomena induces theta brainwave. So we, we come out the normal waking state of what we normally would be in, and we drop into theta at the time of, it's a bit like a Bluetooth pairing. That's the best way I can describe it between you and the phenomena. Well, and that's where it also relates to, you could almost say the time violation. It's all related. It's all, in my opinion, it's all connected. It's all related. And if you're talking about, I believe you mentioned it was a loss of time in the location of the phenomena. And yes. so that means essentially that you could say space time is expanding to some degree. 
And if space time is naturally being expanded during these events, that means your alpha wave, the alpha harmony, which is a denser vibration, would also be expanded and be pushed essentially towards the yep. theta state. So yep. just being in presence of these phenomenon would naturally push all your brain harmonies into a less dense state. Yeah, it's, it's, this is a problem because we didn't realize what was happening to people. You know, I mean, it's not just a, an experience of visually seeing something or sound, you know, the sound of something. But generally, people were unaware what was taking place to them psychologically. And now we know. And that, I mean, the fastest that has happened is 20 seconds. We can lose our discernment. You know, and this is, you know, my colleague Barry Fitzgerald has done a considerable amount of work on this. And um, I mean, it might even happen faster. I don't know. But after 20, we have 20 seconds, you know, to recognize, you know, what the phenomenon wants to deliver, what it wants to do. And we have to listen to our bodies. That's what we have to do, not equipment. The best equipment is us, you know, and the skin reaction and your feelings, your, you know, your intuitions, your survival sense, those sort of things. Those are people ignore those warning mechanisms all the time. Uh, and, but it's there for a reason, you know. Um, so we're used to using that. And it's best, obviously, when conducting investigations, and I've said this to many people, active investigations isn't for everybody, but if they are, and you are in a remote location, then you need to be on your guard. It's not always love and light. People do have bad experiences. So you've got to protect yourself to some degree. And that is going into that location, being the best you can, um, not consuming any forms of amounts of, um, of sugar, the refined sugar, because it causes adrenal weakness. So it's disconnecting us from our fight or flight, that yep. mechanism, that survival sense. It's disconnection. And most people do, don't even think about it. You know, they're taking candy bars and, you know, and chocolate and <laughs> coke, you know, and all sorts of things which have so much sugar in them. They go, I've, I, know, I, I know what they do. But at the end of the day, though, they, they're blinding themselves to the probably the most important aspect of a warning mechanism. Forget your pieces of equipment. They can fail. Phenomena can cause your equipment to just stop, fail drain your batteries forget it i mean you, without power forget it you've got nothing um but one thing that we do have is ourselves our mechanism our survival sense that intuition you know the fight or flight so and it's there for a reason and we and i would not ignore it if your body's telling you screaming at you to get the hell out of there then you get the hell out of there <laughs> you know but then you know people do have experiences and the body's been fine you know they say okay you know, you know some people have some okay experiences but you've got to protect, you don't, you can't be ignorant. All we've be basically done is we've put all the data on the table because we thought there was an imbalance. And it was for many years. Everyone was going, oh, it's all love and light. They're here to say planet Earth. No, they're not here to say planet Earth because they're not doing like, any good job. In fact, there's more money being spent looking for new planet Earth than trying to save old planet Earth. And even if we stopped it today, it would take 25 years to press, you know, to slow down and stop. We've already gone past the problem. So it's not about saving planet Earth in that sense. Is it about saving humanity? Well, they've not intervened in wars, you know, and mass killings and wars, usually associated with religion or greed or land, um, which is just pointless. But at the end of the day, I don't see them stopping it. You know, yeah. if they were to appear to a highly, you know, a civilization that had a, a high respect for religion, it could end it in a day. No, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I don't think we're the focus in, in and the planet, but I think it's their own intentions and what they want to do and what they want to learn from us and the planet, of course. Um, so it makes it very interesting as to, who, you know, how we should react in regarding phenomena. And most people were saying it was love and light and it was this imbalance. But all we've basically done is, because the, the bad experiences were always brushed under the carpet, always. They didn't want that information out. But we took the information out from under the carpet and put it on the table and said, look, this is the phenomena as it is. Take it or leave it, you know, but do not be ignorant of it. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I'm trying not to get too far into rabbit holes, but it almost seems like um, through the thought forms that we've been receiving through our subconscious mind, it creates fractals of humanity essentially to where we're not harmonizing as one structure we've all developed our own cultures visions of success and through technology we've been guided to create artificial intelligence and things of that nature 
um, separating us from humanity even more. And I kind of have to say it because this is what's coming to mind after you say all that. But it's like, so is there the earthly plane? You could say, is there some other more be benevolent plane? Is there a more a denser plane that's not as nice? And are they trying to somehow? No, I don't. I don't think it's, it's, it's you know some people have some ideas. It's a personal or professional opinions, but um, I think it's all one source. And the reasons being is because the connectivity between all these varied phenomena, varied entities, up to three thousand different ones now, they all have a different mask, but the phenomena stays the same. They all act the same way. We're dealing with a source that is interacting uh, with humankind in in a purpose fashion of absurdity. It delivers absurdity because it's a it's a form of psychological warfare on the human perception. Because you can never work it out, you can never cannot connect the dot. People will never believe you because it's too profound. That's what this phenomenon wants to deliver. You can't work it out. They they deceive. Um, they tell some good stuff, they tell some bad stuff. Um, it's just in the same as their actions. I think it's just, you know, you've got a source that's doing whatever it wants to do. And they might have be varied agendas. Some aren't so nice, some are okay. But then we, it's hard to understand that there are things that are godly compared to the human being. They have godly power. So what is God? At the end of the day, I mean, these things do have godly power. They've demonstrated this. Even be able to go through physical objects, uh, physical, you know, into volcanoes, mountains, cliffs. You know, they 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 are quad medium capabilities, not trans medium capabilities. Of course, they know that, but they don't want to put that out. Um, the problem is, is that when we start to put all this on the table and we start to look at it, you can, you know, what is it that we're actually dealing with? Because it's highly intelligent. And it, it knows us so well. We are puppets on a string. We can't control this. We'll never, ever control this, no matter you know how much we'll try. Um, and there'll always be one step. We can't hide anything from them because they can, you know, they can obtain information directly from the source, from us. They know what we're thinking. We've done experiments and asked questions when they've answered the they've answered the questions before we've even given them. <laughs> you know, so it's they know, they, they can see right through us and they can manipulate and they can use our switches in our mind or in our brains to cause issues for us, like paralysis, for instance. I mean, and there's nothing that they're developing to create paralysis, to just switching us into that brain mode, you know, paralysis during REM process during night. It's, you know, it's the mechanism's already there. All you got to do is press the buttons, which is electronic uh, and electrical signals in the brain. And the thing is, is that, we can't get ahead on this um, and even try. All we can do is hope and encourage them to share. But when they do, these deceptions there, you know, and when you really want to press them, they'll just take a step back or they won't communicate or they'll even tell you, we can't tell you that, <laughs> which is very frustrating. That's why I think it's a, it's a really complicated structure. And from what I've come to, from my personal understandings is that, there's somewhat distortions of yourself to begin with. Um, yeah. And I think when people start to understand concepts such as like the tulpa and how yeah. waveforms collapse through the different dimensional layers, um, they, they can get a better idea of how the postures or thought forms that we hold actually somewhat act as habitats for beings to exist within. Um, and I think the one study that you've spoken on several times in the videos I've watched, I recommend everyone go see Steve Mira's um, channel, a Steve Mira official, um, is the Philip experiment. I think that's extremely fascinating. And I think when people really comprehend that, they'll get a better idea of what non-human intelligence is. Well, yeah, I mean, it's all down to how we want to look at it. I mean, there was an experiment prior to the Philip experiment, known as the Soros experiment, in regarding... Um, items being able to be moved by the source and um, that progressed into physical um a manifestation of of a something that was generated through thought you know philip put place in ontario in canada canada by a number of scientists and psychologists and they created a ghost who thought the the design of him what he looked like his whole life his name his family you know, and it was that 
the thought process on a regular basis that brought it into meaning, into the real physical world. Now, the problem is, is this, is that it's all down to, okay, so what is it? It's being generated through physical thought or psychological thought, I can say. Um, is it? Or is this something on the other side? It's willing to take all that information from all those positive thoughts, constant, and create something, the tulpa. And we think that we are the ones that are, are in responsible for the creation, when in fact, all we've done is, is we've asked the intelligence to create it for us in a, in a roundabout way. Um, these things, you know, bringing things into the, into the realism of this world is not the first time. And all you've got to do is look at the C5 initiative. You know, I mean, having five mediums around a table or sales, manifestations taking place is no different than having five meditators sat around a circle and having UFOs take place. It's the same phenomena. It's just a different mask. Same phenomena. 100%. I definitely think so. And um, that's that's basically what I've come to see is that our, our postures, the state of mind that we're holding, um, essentially creates habitats for beings to exist within. So I wasn't really sure if that's um, us creating a habitat and now the being evolves within that habitat, or if it's already existing in that habitat. Well, exactly. It's very hard to know, isn't it? Because all we can do is measure the results. And when we measure the results, there's no mechanism there to say how I was created. We've only got ourselves to say, okay, well, we played a part in it, if not all of it, part of it. But what if we did play a part in it, then something else is playing a part in it. You know, and we have to say, okay, well, it's very similar to the infestation process of poltergeist phenomena in many cases. There's been de demonstrations, you know, through specialized experiments, some of which I've been involved in, when they like to demonstrate their capabilities of metaphysical phenomena. And some of these manifestations, balls of light, which are, have mass to them, very brilliant. I mean, brilliant in your normal, any bulb you would ever look at, but brilliant in color and light. And um, so they'll bounce across the table, bum, 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 then go through the table and come up through the table and down and up and go bum, bum, bum again. So it's a demonstration by them saying, hey, we are we can control metaphysical phenomena if that wasn't enough there were incidents when items were moved across the table they were told by direct voice phenomena which is neither male nor female it's always up it's always above you if you stood up you all sat down but it's not when we record those voices they're not human vocals there's no vocal cords it's it's a generated sound that's supposed to sound like it sounds like voices but they're certainly not according to the frequencies they're recorded at and the, the directive was to pick up the item after being moved several times, and you couldn't pick it up. Your hand would go right through it. You could bounce lasers off it. It would create flares, and uh, you, it would also create shadows. It was physically there by looking at it. Your hand didn't feel cold when going through it. It didn't feel numb going through it. No other detector picked up any anomalous readings around it. And yet, for a period of a short period of time, it was looked physical but was non-physical in our reality and this is what the ufo phenomena does because it's sometimes just because we see a ufo we go oh my god and just say it's there it's real underlined but what is real some of this phenomena the ufo phenomena has the capabilities of switching into metaphys different metaphysical sides so one minute it can be physical the next minute you might see it but it's non-physical it skirts our reality this is why they can go into water and there's no wakes. You know, this is why they pass close to aircraft and there's no wakes. It's not picked up on radar. There's no difference in speed when it enters into water. You know, no inertia effects, no physical effects, because it's skirting our reality. And they have the capabilities of just switching from that non-physical source to make it physical when it wants to really react and act in our reality, which means to come down and land and interact with us it has to become physical in nature. So something happens, they become physical, they come down, they leave marks on the ground, trace evidence, and interact. But when they want to, they can just dematerialize. They can just become, you know, like look physical in nature, but are not within fully within our reality. Same thing as the paranormal is the same. 
that's why I, that's where I think that um the UFO and the paranormal is highly highly intertwined there. But it also circles back again to relativity and quantum mechanics and being in a same a similar reference frame of some sort to where it's matching the vibrations of our brain harmony, right? Oh yeah. It needs to be in our alpha beta information matrix for us to perceive it. And if it has the ability to travel through, which is somewhat not, not necessarily proven, but in, an indication of the time dilations that you see through your, your experiments, um, you see that it could be coming from a denser energetic state and expanding outward. Um, and so that denser energetic state would be closer to, I'm just throwing this out loosely, but a slow gamma or a fast gamma state of mind. Um, to, just yeah. something, or even beyond, because I think that delta through fast gamma is almost like the visible spectrum for a human. But ways, yes. ways, <laughs> it's, it's small band of, yeah, exactly. And so we, there's what I call the lower verse energies that are longer than delta and no verse energies that are, you know, faster or smaller than fast gamma. Um, yes. And so I think that there's information matrices at all the different levels. And that's why I really like the time because people want evidence, right? And there's... Well, you know what? This is what it's about. It's about the data. It's about the evidence. You know, I mean, I, I travel all over the world and I do lectures in different countries, but I've done that for a long time. And, you know, I, I, when I'm at these events, I hear some very interesting stories. But for me, like a science guy, I have to... I, okay, it's an interesting story, but we need evidence. We need data. You know, we've got to have something. We've got to have something more reliable than just a very good story. I'm not saying not true. But what I'm saying is, is that if you walk away without any data, then it's just another mountain to the stone we've already, you know, sorry, another stone that we've already got to the mountain of them that we've got over the years. We're not getting any closer advancing our studies as to what this phenomena represents. So we have to employ science, but it's specific types of science, such as um, power normal mechanics. In paranormal mechanics, which is certain types of science associated to the studies that we're involved in, we discovered that an apported mug in a, in a poltergeist infestation um, when under analysis, microscopy, atomic microscopy, demonstrated that the computer systems didn't even recognize the apported mug, even though bench tested against uh, its, its sister mug, which was in the same pattern, which is at the same time. Only three months old, but it couldn't identify that it was even the mug, and because it knows what to look for on the sam on the on the on the sample, but when looking at the apported mug, it just couldn't identify. And it, it was basically because there was a significant, huge, significant diathermic alteration that had taken place in the mug. It was crazy. We've never seen anything like it before. Now, what was interesting is that that diathermic reaction or alteration, should we say, that took place in the mug. It's pretty much identical, if not the same, to the diathermic alteration in plants when UFOs manifested close to the ground and affected the plants. Guys came out, scientists, to test the plants. It was known as a plant biological traumatology test. And the plants were severely affected. And why? Because they'd gone under some strange diathermic alteration. When you look, look at these side by side, you start to scratch your head and and you start to think, well, is the manifestation of a UFO and the manifestation of mug utilizing utilizing the same physics here? You know, well, so it starts giving clues. I was I've I, I know a little bit about the plants, but only through um, crop circle studies where they show that the nodes of like where the different yeah, well, that's just the yeah, that's just a heating process, right? Uh, you know, because obviously when you apply microwave heating to the crop. Um, the nodes which store water heat up and the expansion causes them to burst. The plants start to become buckle because they're not rigid anymore because the water gets warm inside the plant and they start to buckle and fall in certain ways. Um, yes, there is that side of things in regarding crop formations, but I'm talking about plants being caught in the auric field or something of a manifestation process of a ufo or uap when in close proximity these are adversely affected within our reality when they so whatever this thing that came through was in it decided to be within our reality to affect our reality so it wasn't you know non-physical it must have been physical in nature the manifestation to affect its surroundings and it affected it in such a way that left clues to suggest 
that the manifestation process of the UFO and the manifestation process of an apported mug in a poltergeist case might be utilizing the same physics here. And if that is the case, then we start to think, okay, there's a mechanism. There's a, there's a mechanics are involved. You know, so this is what paranormal mechanics is. It looks at the tiny little areas of research and we start to realize, oh, okay. We now realize that sometimes we lock things into, into not moving in regarding poltergeist projectiles because we're watching them and of course once you you know you know what i'm going to say you know the do slit experiment you know, when you, the wave forms and stuff so when you start to look away you're changing the whole aspect of the incident and what the we, we kind of i think we release the phenomena to be able to do what it wants because of lack of observation we these are all paranormal mechanics and it's, and it's fascinating there's hundreds of these paranormal mechanics that we study um, but when you look at them, they're all like, okay, yeah, it's evidential. It could work that. That's we're trying to put the pieces together and trying to understand what we are experiencing rather than what is the experience. We don't need to know what the experience is. We need to know how it's doing it, and that starts getting very interesting. I, I remember you speaking one time on um, there's a, a common distance that the objects would move. Um, the displacement, yeah, the displacement effects, and it was ignored for many times, but people didn't think about it. I mean, how many people actually take an apple and analyze it? And what we realized, which was interesting, is that when we relocated the apples from people's homes, these were people that having poltergeist disturbances, the high severity, high frequency cases, so three or four, five, six incidents a day, every day. But as soon as we re relocated the apple, as soon as it happened, we got rid of it, moved it elsewhere. Phenomena sometimes seem to really follow the airport. And when it did, there was a three or four day suppression in the home. And the, the people used the contact us and say, well, have you got rid of it? And we said, well, no, we're studying what's going on. It was an, an, an adverse effect in the phenomena because it wasn't being delivered to the location. It was being delivered to where the airport was for a short period of time. And then it stopped and relocated back to the homes as if it, it realized the game was up. So we thought, okay, so the if the app ports act as a deliverance system, it's acting like a quantum anchor to deliver phenomena to the location. It's left a it's left dump something there for it to be able to deliver. So it makes it easier for them because they are very resourceful on the ice phenomena. Um, but I think by relocating the app port, the app ported objects, different things. Um, it caused some temporary confusion until it kind of realizes what's gone on. Um, so again, it's uh, the, the you know these mechanisms, the mechanics to the paranormal. We're starting to realize and learn more about this phenomena. We can't do it by just get, getting more and more people saying we've seen the same thing. We really got to look for the the evidence and the data, and it does get very interesting, as you say, because. You know, the working out exactly what this phenomena represents, you start to realize how closely it's connected to the UFO phenomena. These things were purposely compartmentalized a long time back. They didn't want the paranormal guys and UFO guys working together. They'll start to connect the dots. Now we can tear those walls down and just look at it as a whole, known as phenomenology. And the areas of research that people were applying in the 60s and 70s on particular paranormal cases or UFO cases they weren't getting a full conclusions of data because they weren't looking in the other camp. They are only looking in the UFO camp, the data that's been collected over the years. But the information was in the paranormal psych parapsychological section. And once you take that and apply it in here, you kind of go, oh, it's it's a round hole and a round peg. It fits, it, it, it works. That's what makes us look at fundamentally across the whole spectrum of phenomena. And it's being delivered in various different ways, but we take away the mask, take away the, the incident, look at what the phenomena is doing, and you find it's the same thing. Cryptid, paranormal, ufological, supernatural, they're all, it's very clever and very intelligent and evolving this phenomenon, learning. That, that's where like CE5 relates to the idea of creating a tulpa, right? At the end of the day. Exactly the same. So would you... But there, okay, so one thing I've had against the whole 
not against, but one thing I don't think people realize when they're doing CE5 and they're listening to a, a pre-recorded tape made by a specific individual, well, maybe they're all interacting with his tulpa when they do that. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, it does work and you are experiencing this is not a um a three-dimensional um projection or of the phenomena it is the phenomena it's you know which you're interacting with um it's the same phenomena you interact with around the sales tables it's you know it's it's exactly the same just done on a different scale uh, but done in the same method however it is a real phenomenon that we are dealing with. And consciousness, belief, thoughts, and things like that is something very strongly connected with this phenomena. Um, the phenomena seems to measure, understand, recognize its efforts from those that wish to experience it. But what the phenomenon likes most of all, and I can tell you, and, and it's a shame really, because coming from a science side, which I have, you can imagine my frustration when you can't bench test it properly. Because what the phenomenon wants to do is we countless tests have been taking place and the best results are always with people that are believers. If you bring a skeptic to the table, there's a weak link and it won't work. And I thought hard and long about this. Is that is it done purposeful so that we can't scientifically repeat the process and bench test it? I, th I thought initially it was, but it, no. I, and in fact, I think what it was really is uh, it's a bit like faith apparitions. If you don't believe in religion, you're not going to experience in anything like faith apparitions. And faith apparitions are apparently real. It's a real experience, but it's delivered through belief, just like stigmata is a real thing. And it's the power of belief. You know, we can bring things into the physical realm and even, you know, even affect ourselves. But the, it's seemingly the phenomenon likes believers, you know, and interacts better with them. So we do know that um, there is a connection with the thought process um, of the human mind in regarding how we want to experience this phenomena and how it be delivered to us. And that's where the power of the mind, you could say, is is very, very powerful. And you have monks, Shaolin monks, they can do amazing feats of physical feats. I don't even want to start describing them, but you know, like handle fire, um, balance yeah. on pointed ob objects, things like that. Um, so the power of the mind itself is extremely powerful. And even the placebo effect has been proven to show medical, you know, advantages at times. Um, you get well, yeah, sure we wanted to learn what, the, what our capabilities are, you know, in regarding belief. And it's interesting. That's why we had the placebo effect and that's how it works. Um, and it still works today in regarding many different aspects um, that's been delivered and proves the same. Um, the thing is that the mind, the, the, you know, the psychology and the psychological aspects of the human mind overpowers the physical body. It is not the physical, which is the priority here. It's the psychology. It's the psychological aspect that governs over the physical body. We've had people under hypnosis and we put two pence piece on their arm and told them it's hot and they blistered. You know, it's not hot, but the blister appeared. This is how, you know, self-induced spontaneous physical marking, SISPM, we call it it's stigmata. It's a, the stigmata in the Christ wounds. It's how it happens, you know, and when people... When research, best research ever took place in the 80s, the, um, a lot of information went out and it was confirmed by the Vatican. It more than likely was correct that Christ would have been nailed through the wrists as opposed to the palms. You know, and a lot of that phenomena moved, relocated to the wrists instead of the palms. Um, and, and this is what it's been going. And it's like, you know, what you can be such a strong believer that you can put a piece of wire through your body and you not bleed. When you pull it out, you know, it's and and it have no, uh, you know, extra healing properties and all sorts of strange things. It, the power of the mind is incredible. Now imagine if we take all that energy on thought process and apply it to one thing, contact. Right. Then, you know, people underestimate that we are in the race. We've got a race. You know, we've got a horse in the race. We are associated with this thing. You know, I rarely is there. Um, it's just all completely one sided. Most of the times, it's people. It is a, a conjurer from both sides interacting, and sometimes the people who are having those experiences just aren't aware of what they're doing. 
Exactly. And that's, so that leads into something that I've been thinking about for the last couple of minutes is the hitchhiker effect. So now you, you go out there, you don't really know what you're doing. It's, it's like, it's like paddling out into the middle of an ocean. Yeah. You've never been out before. Right. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we started doing our experiments, I mean, there were 17 specialized experiments. There's only four in the public domain at the moment because it has to, you only release things every now and again when it's digestible, should we say at certain times. But when I first witnessed phenomena, Changed my life. I admit it. In in a day, my life, just everything went out. All the science, the reasoning, everything. Because what I was experiencing was things that couldn't exist or shouldn't exist. Um, and if it wasn't just you know, if it was just me experiencing it, then I probably thought, I'm, I'm, I'm a fine, this is Steve. You've lost the you've lost the plot finally. You know. Um, but no, there was you know was shared experiences, and people, all the people have had those experiences. When experiencing that, it's very exciting. And you go back again the following day and you want to interact. And the following day, you want to interact. But what happens is by the time you get into sort of eight or nine days, it's coming back with you. And you, like I say, you don't want to, this isn't a phenomenon you can take home to meet the parents. He won't let you. You know, he stays in control. And uh, it can be problematic. At lowest level, it's a nuisance. Uh, at the highest level, it can create terrible negativity and a sequence of multiple serendipities and coincidences of a negative nature in which you have to start questioning reality itself. Um, so respites have to be programmed into the process of experiments. The, the, you know, the two in five and the three in seven, we call it. And so you're only allowed to do it two times out of five days or three, day, three out of seven at most. So that you don't have it doesn't get under your skin because what this film does it wants to incite you and wow you that's why it's called the wow <laughs> you know it's, um and it wants to because it wants you to keep coming back and as you as it's putting on the performance and doing all these fantastic things and you're excited you're going oh my god it's getting under your skin slowly gets under your skin and then it kind of hooks on then when you don't realize you're bringing your work home with you and it can affect not only you but the other people in your in your environment yep um, and so therefore you've got to kind of there's a process of not overindulgence through excitement and i tell you it's hard we all went through that same process because we didn't know and it is exciting we didn't realize that we, we have there was limitations we've got to be careful so we dip our toe in regularly but don't immerse ourselves <laughs> Fully. You have to take a break. If not, it becomes overwhelming at the end of the day. I mean, um, and so once it gets under your skin, you could say it starts creating a pacing motion within your life, right? And that's going to affect every single person that you're connected to, to oh, yeah. where they have to adjust the way that they're behaving because you've now changed the way that you're behaving. Um, so it, it's like a, a domino effect of energetic states, you could say, or mental states. Yeah. Um, so for you know, there's always the cure for the common cold. What would you say would be like the cure for uh, a hitchhiker or something of that nature? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. well, we've done this ourselves. Basically, you just got to stop. You've got to completely stop. You've got to clear your mind from the work and not engage even thinking about what you're going to do next. You've just got to stop. And I don't mean just physically stop, but psychologically stop. Don't lie in bed at night thinking what your next experiments are. You just have got to cut yourself off. Takes control that. Apart from, but the best way to control that is to occupy yourself with something completely opposite. So have something that you do, which is so mundane and normal. Uh, okay. So it's so easy to to do that. What you've got to do is you've got to immerse yourself in something so mundane and normal, um, and focus on that so much. And so that you forget everything in regarding what we're doing, regarding the research and stuff, it starts to disengage on that process because, you know, it's thinking, okay, I'm I'm not being recognized for what I'm worth, my worth and all this sort of thing. So it's, we see this disengagement take place. And over a period of time, we start to realize, okay, well, it's been very quiet and we start to creep back slowly and we get into the program. This is, this, this is, it's took time and time of failure before we realized we're there's better ways to deal with this. Yeah, so I would, I would say psychological, you know, the, the process of elimination of the hitchhiker. Sometimes they're so 
steadfast that they the heart because there is a hierarchy in some of this phenomena. There is there's the small guys and the big guys. You know, sometimes when they send the big guns in, they are hard to deal with, more so than the the average ones. That's that's interesting for me. For me, what I've come to realize is if um you could say a lot of paranormal activity might be happening. If you for me, if I go out and connect with nature, like the rising and setting of the sun, and align my circadian rhythm, um, a lot of that turbulent energy goes away. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a number of things. I mean, what happens is is that the engagement by regular phenomena will cause a lack of iron in your body, um, so you'll need to take iron supplements. Um, we utilize UV at home we utilize iron at home actually um anything that we can use which is a form of deterrent uh, and changes your biological system because a lot of people have these experiences on a regular best when, when you're looking at some high severity frequency cases when we test the people they've always got literally no iron or most anemic you know and that's what this phenomenon does it, it, it seems to uh, deplenish the the amount of iron in the human body and these people are usually having their worst experiences at the least time, well, at times when there's least iron in the bodies, funny enough. It goes back a long time, though, actually. That's very interesting. Um, we've gone for about an hour now. Do you want to keep going or? Yeah, a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. If you've got questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I kind of lost my train of thought, but. <laughs> well, you were asking about how we got rid of the hitchhiker effect. You know, it's, it takes a long time, but we end, we end up creeping back. But we learn from our experiences. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, okay. I, I think I know what I was talking about. You mentioned the UV light, but also um, you've also mentioned magnetic fields, positive magnetic fields, negative magnetic fields. UV light seems to act as a deterrent because you could say it's a more sanitized. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's various different types of phenomena, but when people start talking about I'm experiencing phenomena, it's disturbing me at night, it's problematic, it's scary, it's doing this, it's doing that. And there's more likely some type of form of negative type disturbances that tend to take place. Those tend to take place during the evening um, where there's no sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, and people are often waking up at times like two, half past two, three o'clock. Three o'clock is the big, big thing. And that's an indication of the negative phenomena interacting. We utilize UV because they seem to be act as a deterrent to negative phenomena. They don't like to be around it. So we've utilized UV to kind of keep them from at bay and let people sleep a bit better. Because what they want to do is disturb your sleep patterns. It changes your whole chemistry of your body. It makes you more vulnerable to the phenomena. And over a period of time, it winds you down to a point where you're highly vulnerable of a lack of iron in the body. Supplements, iron water, iron supplements into the body immediately causes a vast distance, uh, uh, sorry, a vast change in regarding the phenomena and the phenomena will be at distant now. It will start to distance itself from those individuals that have been plagued by these disturbances. Um, but there are other experiences that seem to be a positive, you know, normal type experiences, which people have. And we don't have a problem with that. We accept the fact that, you know, just as a man walking down the street might be a good guy or a bad guy, we don't know. Um, it's this is like the phenomena, you know, it is it, that. It's just like us, it's just like humanity. We don't know. Some are doing some things which aren't very good, and some are doing things which are quite pleasant and they have attachments with people. But attachments do happen, even on a physical basis. Interesting. Hmm. What I what I noticed you mentioned was um oh two... the magnetics. You remember you yeah. mentioned magnetics, the, the positive magnetic anomalies. These have been identified. We weren't the first people to recognize this. It was the, actually the, the US Army realized this in the 1980 to 82. They're looking at the association between UFOs and positive magnetic regions. Um I usually have 200 or 250 nanotesla plus. Just nanotesla. These are hot, they are hot areas. You'll find that a lot of activity of manifestation of phenomena takes place in those areas. We've seen 411 people, places that's, like Skimmer. That's Skimmer even more, more evidence. To, that's more evidence to suggest that they're coming from a depth. Like you have the time dilations, but you also have the magnetic anomalies. And it, it shows that there's a relationship with, you could say, magnetic vortices of some sort. Yes. Um, and the ability to even experience the phenomenon. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even NASA, you know, a few years ago confirmed uh, the existence of, well, I don't like the word portal, <laughs> which it was being used. There's a per professional name for them, electron diffusion regions, um, and sustainable. Some of them are large, some of them are small, some of them are micro. You can have micro ones take place in a house, where, and you might think this is where phenomena is being delivered into the home from. It's a micro one, you know, so you can get them like this or vast. Yeah, that's, that's what I, um, one of the design, and I've, you know, written, written some series or whatever, and I talk about the mechanics of harmonizing your alpha and beta states to those different energetic states. And the way I've come to see it is you need to make a magnetic vortex that either goes from a point and gets bigger or starts from bigger and goes to a point, and depending on which um, density or information matrix you're trying to harmonize with. Yeah, I mean, uh, phenomena just doesn't walk through your front door. You know, I mean, this is what people think, you know, a phenomenon just followed me home and came through the front door. No, there's a point of entrance in homes. It generates a point, a, it generates an entrance, generates a doorway. <laughs> it might be microscopic, but it's it generates a doorway. They are measurable, um, especially when they're being used. And they 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 are created there as a uh, as a, a fast track to be able to get into the in and out. The location is a it's a, an entrance and an exit location. It's the same outside in the external world. Exactly the same. Just because we don't see these things doesn't mean they don't exist. And we don't, not everybody carries equipment around to recognize those things are taking place. I mean, you know, we have special detectors now that tells us when we're walking through an affected area of radiation. It might only be a four foot by four foot square, but something's took place there. And that the phenomena sometimes when it interacts in our environment leaves a trace elements, uh, elements behind of radiation. People walking through that evidence all day long, they wouldn't know. You know, and this so, is the problem, blinded yeah. by not seeing seeing it. You were mentioning the occult practices earlier. I know that a lot of them are into the, you know, you could say like sigil magic or something of that nature, where they're actually creating structures, right? They're like, you could say they're creating a, a an orientation of different little trinkets and whatnot to make a shape that could there's, lots of, there's lots of different ways. I mean, it's all invocation. So the thing is with invocation is that you can you can access this info i don't can't tell you that <laughs> sorry i can't no I, I can tell you this though um <laughs> there's um there's a process of direct communication with a phenomenon it's very successful all the time it's the fast track and it's through invocational practices i can't go into the details about that much but it works but it's not a good way nor is it the safe way the safe way is to like like we are now is work our way of acceptance because they've got to accept us as we've got to accept them and it's a communication and once that communication is open it doesn't close down it's like the phone is still off the hook you can go back again and re-establish very quickly um but invocation can be applied where you get it straight away and it is the phenomenon but it's like bashing on the door rather than you know tapping on the door can I get your attention? This hammers at the door. They sometimes don't like that, and it's not the best way to do it. Sometimes they, they won't interact with you unless they, you give them something. They usually ask for certain things. You're dealing with different things, um, and some of them are simply just, I can't tell you that or won't communicate. And you've got others that will. You know, we always got to cross-check the information because there's a lot of deception that's involved. But within that deception are some good nuggets of information which you think okay yeah that's checked out and it seemingly is true so we can accept the fact that we are being told some truths but not all of them and they'll never give us all this is why boeing and bell and douglas sat around sales tables trying to get contact information for these non-human intelligences about advanced aviation bits that they could employ into the program of building some of these aircraft um, just the same as the drill society did during the second world war you know and Luckily, you know, they don't give all the information. That's why the German saucer program was unsuccessful. Oh, yeah, they look great. Well, you know, <laughs> your Volkswagen Beetle could travel faster, you know, and, and this is the problem. But it was World War because German technology is incredible. And if they'd obtained air supremacy, it, everybody's lives would have been changed. The UK did have, did employ an aspect of being able well, they actually drawn up the paperwork to surrender to Hitler. If it wasn't for the Americans coming in and helping, 
you know, it would have been a very different world for many of us. But the fact is, is that it wasn't employable enough. They didn't get all the information and they don't because they'll never give it all. They give you in tiny little bits and it takes a long time and there's a lot of testing because he wants to keep you coming back. Come back again, you know, and engage and so on and so forth. Um, and it's been the same right across all aspects of communications um, through these experiments or even in the early days. That's very fascinating. Yeah, yeah I a lot of my, like I said, a lot of my dreams are very powerful. And uh, at some point, sometimes it's like, okay, I need to stop meditating because I've been practicing meditation from a very, very young age as well. And you realize, okay, this is becoming overwhelming. I'm like yeah. having a hard time connecting to normal society because of all this stuff. Time well, to yeah, you, can. you can disassociate yourself. <laughs> yes. That's the problem. It's time to cut it out for a little bit. <laughs> you, yeah, you've got to because you're still tethered. You can't completely ignore that you are tethered in this 3D reality that we have. Well, it's actually more than that, but but sometimes it's easy to disassociate yourself so much that you struggle to sort of fit back in place. I've heard of this many times, and it's all down to you know a disassociation with the physical self. Don't, don't worry, there'll be a, certainly a time for that, you know, for all of us. Um, it's good to acknowledge it, but to be in control of it and recognise that you still got one, one foot in this plane of existence, you see. Um, so I have heard of that quite a lot. That's why one of the things I like to speak about a lot is understanding the pacing motions of your life. Like, why are you actually making the motion that you're making? What is the thought form that instilled you to make that action? I think we're steered a lot by things um people are tested you know throughout life and it's not just simply a matter of circumstances that happen um i think some things are planned to happen you know something negative has to happen before something significantly positive which you really wanted to happen will take place there has to be some form of equilibrium and we have to face the fact that people will go through bad times and hardship, but they'll also go through good times. And we cannot expect to walk through this whole life that we have on this planet and everything be a bed of roses because it is, you know, there's equilibrium there. We have to manage those sort of things as well. And I think sometimes, you know, there's a certain things that steer things that might happen um, that certain things want negative things to happen because it knows that it can attach itself and thrive in a location with a negative person. Um, uh, you know, I think there are influences that some of these things are, you know, are, are planned and are planned events are things that we're not in control of, but have to manage. That, that's where it goes into the synchronicities of who you meet, when you meet them, why you met them, why you got upset with this person. I've, I've, do I've dove into that quite a bit myself. I have. I mean, it's, imagine you have a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, you've got all these little dots and all these dots are all these people that you will meet in your lifetime. Interestingly, that if you were a different person, that they might have a completely different piece of paper and completely different dots on their system. However, when you look at the individual dots, you find that sometimes there's inner connections between the dots and the other dots. Like, oh, how does that person know that person? How does that? And that's a bit strange. And da 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 da. That's a bit coincidence. Turns out, oh, that person went to the same same school as me. Uh, turns out that person knows my father. Turns out that I, I lived. I was that place when you were at that place six years ago. There's a, there's like a blueprint of your life and your associates in that life. Interestingly, it has been reported that people who have had can remember and recall um, maybe past life events, that a lot of the people that they recognise in this life were in their last life. So maybe that connection of, I don't know, how many people will you meet in your lifetime? 100,000? 30,000? 20,000, whatever that be, that operating cycle might be replicated. You might swap around a little bit, but you're still in the same cycle over and over. And you see, you, you find that, oh, that person, you know, I remember him from my past life, but he was in, 
He's in this life. I recognise him. And there's been some interesting incidents being reported like that when they go under hypnosis and things. And it's questionable as to, you know, everything looks like, like it's a program. You know, the phenomena sometimes acts like a virus. <laughs> you know, it's it's strange, but it, it is true. You know, and this is long before the idealisms of movies called The Matrix. This has been on the books for a long, long, long time. That's where it almost circles back to what we were talking about, free will and choice. Like, do we have the choice to remove ourselves from these cycles at some points? Can we really use our our postures well, and our... Exactly. I mean, we put it to the test. We had six occasions, just six occasions I've had in my life when I've been told in um, in 19 months' time, um, on the, this particular day, you'll be at this particular place doing this particular thing. Turned out there was no way I was going to be in that place because it's on the other side of the world in a country that, in a place that I thought, well, I have no need to go to. And I never, never thought about ever going there. Why would I be doing that? I don't know anything about what would take me there. I just took, yeah, right, okay. 19 months to that day, I was there doing what I, they said I'd be doing when I was doing it. So when it happened the second time, I thought, okay, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put kibosh this, throw a sabos in the works, and uh, what I would normally do is my normal everyday events, I would do the opposite. Do it personally. It's like going out of the gate and taking a left instead of right. I'm gonna do it on purpose because, you know, let's see him deal with this. Still happened. So I think to myself, okay, they already know the event. And no matter what I do to lead to it, you know, doesn't matter. It's, that was already in the action. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. We couldn't stop it from six times. There was no way of stopping it. They were always right. Well, that's where the free will, you would say, how are you receiving the event? Are you going to take it with a positive attitude or a negative attitude? You know, if, if the physical action is going to happen, then it's like, well, you might as well accept it and love it. Or <sighs> You can try to fight. Know, and fight it's and fight. annoying. It's annoying to think that there's a plan, or, or 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 well, maybe not. Maybe they're just time associated, and I can look ahead in time to see things. They might not be manipulating the event, but they certainly can be aware of it and, and, and inform us of it. So, you know, in a different time streams, that's probably already taken place. Um, so don't know, don't know. It's really difficult because we can't work it out. We have the manipulators of it, the guidance of it, or they know of it. Um, whatever happens, though, it's interesting to point out that there is plans ahead for people, seemingly, unknowingly, uh, which we don't seem to be able to alter, which is interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm not aware about precognition or very good cases of precognitive events where people have stopped the event from happening because you end up with a paradox thing thing you're doing theory don't you with that well if they stopped it they wouldn't have had the premonition in the first place um and i've heard only a handful of cases oh yes i stopped this i told my mum not to get on this plane and she didn't and this hasn't well you know what there's a certain amount of coincidence that get involved in these matters all right just by chance the plane was a bit funny anyway or or was it truthful or anything the weight seems to lie in the fact that we don't have the capabilities of changing it by future knowledge because it's predestined. So do we like me not going out and taking a left turn and a right turn or doing something purposely to sabotage an incident happening would never result in the incident not happening. So it was pointless. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. I like to think we have free will. <laughs> I hope so. I do hope so. You know, I really do. Yeah. Then we can always argue the point, well, you, yeah, if we decide to think that we've made positive change and changes, was it not already planned for us to do that? Or or was it just that they had a knowledge that we were going to do that and they told us prior to the event? Either way, it's interesting, but there seems to be certain many time associated anomalies in, in, involved with these disturbances of UFOs and paranormal encounters. Um, so there's something to do with time in there somehow. I don't know, you know, exactly the physics that are involved in this, but because it's uh, it's you know it's it's wow phenomena, it's magic, it's whatever they they want to refer to it. Uh, they, they haven't got a name for it. It's just beyond normality.
No, yeah, I'm not saying we're we're worms, but like, you know, humans have their limited senses and we're trying to understand this infinite universe with infinite we can't even I know. I mean we, we we get a bit naive sometimes to think we should have Oh, I'm frustrated. Why don't I know that? Uh, hello, do you know how big the universe is? You know, what are we? A grain of dust of that, you know, um, and demanding we should have the answers. And, and the thing is, I don't think people realise the complexity that could be involved here and how minuscule we are in comparison of knowledge, you know. Um, but, but what is interesting is that we can do it together. 7.8 billion people on the planet now. We can do it together, make significant change. But do you know what? We've not escalated enough to get people to react the same way anymore. I mean, people just won't. You know, until we can change, um, I don't think we can make a big, significant impact in regarding the destination of knowledge. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's what you're, you're doing with your work. Um, trying. We're, we're trying. all throwing our little pebbles into the pond. and Just doing little pieces, chipping away at it slowly. But do you know what? We are getting some answers. These things have never been obtained before. It's the first time. And we're revealing slowly. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You just find one piece of it. You go, ah, oh, okay, can I work out the picture? No, you've just got one piece in it. How many other pieces are you going to need? You're going to need quite a lot. And you've got to keep going at it. Um, eventually, though, we're hoping, you know, there'll be enough pieces to kind of go, I think I'm seeing a pattern. I think I'm recognising something here, which might lead us, and I believe, you know, into the quantum physics of things and quantum mechanics area is definitely going to be involved in here. Um, but I think we've got quite a bit to go, but at least there's not just me, there's a few other people as well. Trey Hudson is another guy who... Um, who's uh, working on a project known as the Meadow Project, which is very similar to Project Doorway. And his work is just as equal to mine. You know, we're, we're chipping away at the block slowly, but at least people are doing that now. You know, because if you go back 10 years ago, all people were doing collecting another photograph, collecting another video, collecting another account, and and be happy at that and not and be sustained and not want to ask or pry or advance the subject any further. There's only so long we can do that for until we start to say, okay, no, 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 we don't want, <laughs> well, it's interesting, but we don't need another photograph because we know things are, you know, exist. I've experienced them myself. I don't need proof. I don't need uh, another account. I don't need a video. But what I do need is information that leads us to the data because that's the way to take the steps now is the data. And unfortunately, we've not been at the steering wheel. It's been all the big governments and secret programs that have been dealing with it. But now there are people in the public domain, and I've caught their eye because I've had phone calls. And will I come on a meeting? I'm thinking, what meeting? Well, see, somebody wants to ask you some questions. Turns out that it's some working party that won't tell me the names. Um, the advanced working group, which I do know, believe I did some research. These are guys that are ex-military or ex-government. Some of them are still working for government. Asking me questions. The first question was, did I ever work for the MI5? Department of Defense, Ministry of Defense, CIA. I said, none of them. No one worked for any of them. No way. Where did you get the information from? Did Kit Green tell you? Now, Kit Green's a big guy in, in operations of the UFO program for the US government. Did Kit Green tell you? I said, no, I've never talked to Kit Green. I know of him. They're interested in how we got information because we're in the public domain. They, I don't think, they are aware, and probably aware a lot more than we are, of what some of this stuff is going. I don't think they got a full picture, of course. But I think they're under control of, you can't put that out. They're restricted. But we're not. We're in the public domain, and we're unrestricted. But I think they're quite happy for us to do that because we're doing it on their, you know, we're, we're doing the job for them, in a sense of speaking, while allowing people to know that, there is not enough evidence that's ever been obtained, ever, to suggest that the phenomena that's interacting with us is extraterrestrial knowledge. There isn't. It doesn't exist. Hence, the narrative change over the last 18 months has been brought in by, at top level, the government, to interdimensionals and the referencing of non-human intelligences instead of ET. We want to get rid of the old ET. You know, it's, we're entering into a new narrative now, and it's exciting times. 
but it's people now are going, oh, all of a sudden, I'm interested in this. And they go to look into that narrative and find, oh, hang on, we're already there. We've been there for 10 years. Um, but I'm glad we're, I'm glad that we're, we're, we're seeing that now. We're living that time. It's exciting. But it's not something that can be delivered in a disclosure program. It can't. You know, only items can be delivered, you know, and it's not going to work. So it doesn't matter how many UFO hearings people have. You know, the bottom line is, is that it can't be delivered in that manner. You know, and that's a problem, I think. For, that's, for that. I think that's the hardest part about it, is that they they don't really know what, what's you know, going on with it. They don't, they no, don't I really mean, know. You know, I um, mean, there were just aspects of this, and I was asked, if you work for government and you were part of a working group in regarding deliverance of information to the general public, is the items that you would not release? And I said, yeah. Be honest, yeah, there is truthful, truthful answer. I would, despite how much I want the world to know, I do massive concerns of how this is going to be dealt with, not just on an economical basis, but ecological, uh, religion, you name it. The implications are huge. And how long has it took us? Well, do you know what? It's been countless years, and we still can't even manage politics and religion and what can we we can't even do it now which what we're still trying now we're still failing you know so it's it is scary and i have to say no you cannot and people want security how are you supposed to turn to people and say we're dealing with phenomena it's right under our noses it can do interact with us at any given time it wants to and we cannot stop it or control it that is you don't want to be saying that to the general public, you know. So the generated ruse is, oh, yes, it's like Star Trek. They're all bipedal aliens coming from all these vast different planets. And they did that on purpose. And I think that ruse has been carried very strong narrative throughout the media on purpose because everything you watch is associated like with that narrative, isn't it? All these vast distant planets. But now they've been pressed and the top people and the guys coming forward and saying, no, no extraterrestrial. Oh, yeah, they're aware of the phenomena, but they're, they're saying interdimensional at the end of the day. They are, they are. I mean, it's you know, in, interdimensional and paradimensional is exactly the same phenomena. You know, it's just terminology and words, and we do we do muddle it up sometimes by creating too much terminology around things, but sometimes it's easy to just call it what it is. And when you call it what it is, because I've done these things in, in groups and I've been talking, tell me what I'm talking about, and I'm talking and Hands go up and say, oh, you're talking about a paranormal incident took place. I said, not talking about a paranormal incident. Then. I'm talking about a UFO incident took place. And they went, what? And I've done it with the UFO guys. You know, and it's like, guys, power guys, UFO guys, you need to get together. Because, yeah. you know, we just, there's no proper learning between these boxes, unfortunately. I just thought that was really funny when you said um, they asked you where you got your information from, who you working for. I was in a in a meeting one time, and they basically came up to me and they said, "Are you a military general or something?" And I, I said, "No, I'm a like, civilian." And I just yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just curious. How, how are we working it out? How are we going public? Where, where's the leak? There is no leak. It's just <laughs> I had to put forty one years in to get there, you know, which is a lot more than some of these guys have worked in that particular area. But the fact is, is that we. We might be at the pinnacle point in the public domain, but we're miles behind. Well, that's where, that's where the public domain in general just doesn't, not, I'm not saying they don't care, but they, they have other interests in mind. They care about the latest movie that came out, the, the TV actor, uh, the, the rap star. I don't know. Well, they, they, they've done that on purpose because it's, you know, they created this social th way of thinking about it now that it's, you know, someone has a, an incredible UFO encounter it gets shared on Facebook and YouTube for the day and it's dissolved. Yep. It's replaced by other news. You might tell local friends and family it's dissolved. You know, it, the MOD aren't taking that information. The, the UK government, they don't want to know anymore. The police don't want to take reports. The priests don't want to hear anything. <laughs> basically, it's, it, it's, it's basically creating a system of dilution of interest. Yep. And, before you know it, they're going, oh, my God, I, I saw this incredible thing. But what's for tea? And what are we going to watch tonight on television? <laughs> you know, and you're absolutely right. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's worked. 
And then the people, they try to tell someone about it and they're just like, oh, well, um, maybe you should go see a psychologist. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that everyone is perfectly sane in their mind, but most people, people, don't, just people don't just make shopping. things up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. That's it. You know, that's it. done. Over. Yeah. It's done. Because um, people, the press have come to me many times and said, oh, well, we believe the UFO phenomenon is not happening anymore. I said, no, 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 no. I said, the UFO phenomenon is happening just as much as ever. I said, it's the reporting of it fluctuations. And the reporting of it is because of certain channels. And those channels are manipulated. You know, so you can manipulate would, information. Between would, would you say that studying this um, phenomenon has made you more of a spiritual person um, compared to other uh, people? Or are you still focus really. on that? really. <laughs> well, um, it goes beyond that. Initially, at first, I thought, oh, wow, you know, but then when I start to realize that, no, this is something else. I mean, there is power in spiritualism um, and belief and religion, and but I think it lies more inward than than a specific time uh, or ruling or thought process. So um, it's not really, no, it, I, I feel comfortable that I have that there, but I also have this. And maybe we are interconnected because we talk about our God who had his bad days. You know, he did smite people. He even in the Bible, you know, he, he he asked for human sacrifice. You know, he had bad he had these bad days, our God. Um, no different than any other deity around the world. And there are millions of deities around the world, millions and claim to have been physical beings and seen and interacted with. And many times they've been seen at the entrances of caves and they become holy caves. And um, whatever was seen at Lords, which has become the most religious visited location in the world, um, was certainly not the Virgin Mary. And St. Benedict said it was, I, what I saw was that thing. She was quite upset about it. And certainly not a Virgin Mary, but of course the church comes in, does things like that. So, you know, they're like the flock. Well, who do who do we pray to at the end of the day? Who are we praying to? What's the Holy Spirit? Should we really allow it in? You start reading stuff, you start to think connections between the phenomena and religious things that have been documented over the years. A lot of the religious items are not taken from the source material. They're, they're, they're fabricated into cherubs and angels and cupids and things, when in fact it was far from it. You know, um, Francis of Assisi was another one. Teresa of a Veil, you know, this, the list goes on and on. But they kind of changed the changed it into something more befitting the Bible. So this is what we read and this is what people think. A close association has been happening, but all these different entities, all these different gods and all these different deities, you know, I think we could even be looking at the possibility of even the word God has been hijacked a number of times. It's hard to say, but it might have been. I first started off my all my work very, very scientifically based, very and then I'm, and then it's like, okay, well, ultimately it's impossible to describe the, the phenomenon without actually using the word like a universal flow or something of infinity, or you can even say God at the end of the day. Well, I, this is it. I mean, you know, I don't often talk about it because there's people when you talk about religion, there are people that are very, you know, very religious, you know, um, devout. And everything is about belief for them, a strong belief. So I wouldn't really, it's very difficult to talk about that because what a number religion has done on us, you know, to accept at our very core of life something that we don't know um, if it is what it is. And this is the problem. What we do know is phenomena takes place. It's a global phenomena. It's intelligent. It's always watching us. It evolves. It assists sometimes. It changes history sometimes. It messes with us. It changes our opinions and our lifestyles, sometimes in multiple different ways. Um, it changes reality around us. It messes about reality. It causes things to make you think that reality is manipulated in some ways by these people or what these things are. 
when you write all that down on the left hand side and write all down the, all the biblical power of gods on the right hand side, you'll find that they're both the same. You know, so I don't know. It's it have through time and all these religions that we've had been an aspect of something which is we're misidentifying it that that is god well our god we all have different ones of course but it is the phenomena uh, and they are god or gods you know because that's how we identify them it's very very difficult as you can well imagine but one thing is for sure is that you know, do we have the evidence of godly power? Well, we can say, okay, faith apparitions take place, faith healing takes place, but that could be down to do, you know, the, like the old, you know, stigmata thing, like the whole, uh, you will heal because we, we you, you will believe we are healing you, you know, because that can happen, the power of the mind. So the problem is, is, is God getting credit there when we're getting the ability to get the credit, should we get the credit? It, who knows? But we do know that the evidence that power normal or whatever this phenomenon represents in multiple aspects has godly power and i don't think we can just throw that away and say oh it's just a coincidence that god also had the same capabilities to to do what these beings did is it all coincidence or is there something to it and it's not as you can imagine it's not something i often talk about because people's beliefs will vary you know from one place to the other around the planet and it gets very complicated some people's lives are literally based on that belief as opposed to it's just something that, you know, is, is part, is in there, but we, we don't, we're not ruled by it. Um, but my personal opinion is, I believe there's an association. That's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not much else to say, honestly. Um, so you've written um, a few books, right? You have one coming uh, out. Yeah, so I've, I've several books. We've got a new book coming out um, next year. Um Staring into darkness, which was writing with Barry Fitzgerald in regarding, because now we kind of realise where this phenomenon is coming from, um, and why it does what it does, and it's it's different. It's it's never anything that you we would have expected, to be honest with you, and things that we've been kept secret from us, things that we didn't realise. Um, so we're going to be talk, we're going to be releasing that book um, probably about about March of twenty five. Um, that'll be the next one out. And then, of course, we're writing the Project Doorway book, which got us into all this in the first place about the, the science behind the phenomena. I've been watching the, those videos on your YouTube channel. You've done a lot of Project Doorway videos. Yeah, I'm just saying a lot of people keep, re, you know, they keep missing them. So I said, right, well, I'll recycle them. So I have to keep recycling them because it's surprising, you know, people go, what's Project Doorway? We've never watched it. Well, no, well, I'll recycle it again. So I'm having to keep redoing them. Um, there's new material coming soon as well um, in, in Project Doorway, which starts to get into the um, the understanding how many people secretly recognise the phenomena for what it represents and started utilising it to benefit themselves and society. Uh, so that starts, we start getting into that into the next season. But um, yeah, we're well, always... Uh, always busy but about several several books that are out and uh, like i said the next book is 2025 um I, i've got obviously steve Mayer official is a youtube channel um i also run a f magazine it's the world's largest digital magazine on the subject you know phenomena magazine.co.uk the archive is there to obtain as well free of charge um or if you can find me at my at my my uh, youtube channel my website uh, stevemera.com uh, but most people, I just say, look, do you know what? Just type Steve Mera, M-E-R-A, <laughs> into the Google. And you'll, I'll pop up somewhere because I've been doing this. It, for it a while. comes up. There's quite a bit there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite. I'm easy enough to find. But I've always made myself available for people to talk because, at the end of the day, why am I doing this if I don't share the information? It's pointless. I've got to. You know, I'm not going to be around forever. I've got to get this information out. So new people have to come in and pick up the torch and carry on and, and because of that it needs to be because we've got to challenge the control over the knowledge of this phenomena we have to sort of start getting smart and doing things for ourselves rather than relying on specialized programs to hopefully one day tell us what's going on well that, well that's what's funny to me is that people are holding their breath waiting for the government to tell them what's going on but they don't even know what's going on to begin with and so they're looking up to the sense of authority that has no oh, I give up. <laughs> I gave up on I gave up on the UFO hearings that day when when there were two guys there from the Pentagon, 
And the reference Roswell came up and one looked at the other and said, what's Roswell? And I thought, you know what? The children in school in the UK know what Roswell is. You know, you, and, and that was it for me. Right, okay. I, I know what where this was heading straight away. You know, I mean, they've got some really good video footage and photographs they could have showed. They showed the worst, which some of them are um, misidentif misidentification of aircraft lighting at night in using an infrared film, which generates a particular shape because of the lens shape on that particular camera <laughs> you know I, we know all this the general public don't that's what's frustrating the general public go give me more i believe give me more uh, but for, for professionals like myself and others they look at it and go oh no you know there, i've got things i'll show you things you, you know which was which you think okay this is this is real stuff no it was all very and um, very it was like um a bit like project blue book it was it was like the, the the citizens of the US demand answers. What are these UFOs? Okay, let's let's put on a show. Let's let's show them that we're looking into it and we're and we're really interested and we're we're going to press and get information. Of course, don't give them anything. And I, he's been going. It's exactly the same thing. The, these UFO hearings is no different than Project Blue Book. I mean, all that work and all that stuff. It was done from a six foot by eight foot room, a blackboard, and one desk, and a and a phone on the table. You know, it was a it was fruitless effort. It was just a, all the front. You know, that's why Blue Book officers used to ring up, to ring up the press and say, we're going out to see Mrs. Brown today. And of course, all the press are there. Oh, how fantastic. These are the guys, the, the, you know, the, the coming, getting out of the cars and carrying the satchels, going to talk to Mrs. Brown about a UFO being seen, taking photos, taking video, make, they're doing a grand thing for the country. You know, it's great that the, the, the look, you know, we are, the general public are used and it's a shame because it's just a lack of knowledge, you know, to question, you know, uh, because people still believe that there's no way they can hide a secret. And that is incredible, you know, really incredible. I've got one more question, if, if you're up for it. Um, and this has to do with, you could say, alignments of sorts. Like you mentioned the 2, the 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. type of connection. You could say that's a moment when we transition, when you consider the circadian rhythm of a human, it's when we transition from a delta state into our theta states. So that would be like a one day sort of alignment of this energy. Um, but then there's also one that may be related to the seasons of the year, 185 days. There seems to be alignments of energetic states that allow for the phenomenon to be more pre prevalent. So is there also a relationship to the processional cycle of the earth itself there's a few. I mean, do you know what? We're not so much tied. You know, the actual human body is more tied to the um, the day rate of Mars than it is Earth. Yeah. Um, that's a whole different discussion. It's a <laughs> question. I, just, I guess it wasn't a quick question. <laughs> no. um, but there are multiple factors. I mean, if you want to come from the more spiritual side of things, they'll say that the three o'clock in experiences or interactions or waking up at that time is um, is a negative phenomena and associated with the mockery of the Trinity. And that's why it happens at three o'clock. Um, that's one aspect. You know, there is also aspect about the circadian rhythm, rhythm um, natural sleep processes, and when we are more vulnerable. I mean, of course, the brain's doing more sleep than it is when it's awake. We still don't even know about that, to be honest. Um, there are just several, there's so many. We don't really know. I think it could be all the above. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's problematic. Um, what we can say, so yes, there's, there's evidence of certain things changing psychologically within us at certain times and certain seasons, and depending on where we are, of course, because we're influenced by magnetic fields all the time on planet Earth. Um, you know, because tests were done years ago about people that live in Alaska, you know, and regions like that where there's like, you know, about half the year is is black, half the year is sun. Yeah. You know, what the psychological effects are and sleep processes and dreams and all sorts of things. So a lot of tests have been found taking place. We do know that we are connected to the Schumann resonance of Earth because underground deep bunkers, military ones, when they get so 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 far down, they have to artificially induce the seven point eight hertz of the human resonance because we are connected to it and it causes problems when we're not over long periods of time of you know concentration and irritation yeah. so 
we, you can tell we have a connection with our own planet, and yet the 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 hourly rhythm of the work of the of a, say of a normal day is more Martian than it is is to the 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 hourly the, the day's rate on a Mars as opposed to it is on Earth. So it's it starts getting really really tricky. I've looked into all these things, and I'd say yes, interesting, yes, interesting, yes, interesting. You know, but I can't really put sort of put my finger on it and say it is that. Um, but one thing for sure I can say is that it happens. The three o'clock regularly reported to me um, by many people I've talked to or investigated over the years. Very strange. Yep, yep. Well, is there anything else you wanted to mention or? Uh, no, I think that's, uh, I think I've got everything in there, Lexi. Um, I'm, I'm unavailable on Instagram and uh, on Facebook and Twitter. So I'm everywhere. So I'm easy enough to find. If people have questions, comments, they can always get in touch with me. We're always happy to share information. And I've always made a ruling is that I always try and reach out and get in, back in touch with people. It's really important that I think uh, I've got to share this information because that's what we're doing it for you know, educate and advance the subjects. Yeah, I think it's great. And um, for, you know, people watching, I think that Steve might have one of the, I don't know, I don't want to like rate as best, but I really like your work. Let me just put it that way. I think um, you're on, I, you know, your, your, your work is on point. In my opinion, your work is on point. And I well, think- it, It's truthful. We just, we call it as it is. I mean, you know what, there's a lot of, be honest, Alex, there is a lot of BS out there and you've got to swim through it, unfortunately, to get to the good stuff. But that's the disinformation process. It's designed to put 70% out and just get 30% of the good stuff. Well, that's designed on that purposely. But you know what? We If we think something's dodgy, we always say it is. You know, we've got, you know, there's no, no stones unturned, but uh, we've no horse in a race, you know. And don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, we've had offers for... Can you just do this or can you just say that? You never do, you know, because it's just, I might as well just pack up and give up tomorrow if, I, if we did that. Don't get me wrong, we live in a society, it's hard for people to live. Some people don't have finances and they have to make money and they're challenged every day with the truth or finance. But, you know, I, I'm quite happy to walk away from all that, you know, because I don't, it's just that I want, I want, I want to be able to put, move forward god forbid if the next person the next teenager that's coming along is is going to learn the subject from roswell and rendlesham and all those things they they need to be well gone in the past we need to be moving on of what where and this is where they've been this is the starting place paranormal mechanics association with ufos paranormal where are they coming from what did he want how did he do what they do if they start there they'll be away you know? I agree with that 100%. And I think that's why I'm, dra I'm drawn to your work. I think it, I think it's great. Um, oh, well, thanks so much, Alexi. And yes, uh, I enjoyed the conversation. So let's keep in touch. If you have any other things or you want another chat sometime, just let me know and we'll uh, we'll make some time for it. That sounds great. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your time. And um, ha have a great day. Okay. Talk to you soon, Alexi. Bye for now. Yeah.